education, and the latter rain. That's a picture in Russia, by the way, that uh, they have some beautiful mountains there that they like to take you to. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, it says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. You see any educational words there? Three important educational words. Now, I do think there's a mistake in education today in that the primary thought is that we are to gain knowledge. And of course, knowledge is helpful, but that isn't the main thing. In fact, wisdom is more important than knowledge. And all three of these have their place, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. But notice what the text says, where it comes from. It doesn't come from human beings unless they are connected to God so that his wisdom is flowing through them. And unfortunately, very few teachers realize that fact, that they need to be connected with God so that the information that's coming is coming from God. <clears throat> and they are teaching the students about the importance of getting connected with God so that they can receive wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In John 17, verse 3, it says it this way, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In other words, if we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if he is not uh, changing our life and working in our life, then no matter how much knowledge we have, we're not educated. Because life eternal is to know him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's life eternal. And that's why in the book Education, page 30, it says, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. So if somebody goes through school and they're not connected to God and they don't have a growing relationship with him, then they've just wasted their time because that was supposed to be the whole purpose of education. It's the same thing as redemption. People should be able to make it to heaven better after they go to school than before, if we're doing it right. When we are conducting an evangelistic series of meetings, we often do not think of that as education. But if the work of education and the work of redemption are one, then it is. It's the same thing. And mainly what education is about is to become acquainted with God through some of the many avenues that he has revealed himself in this world. That's the purpose of education as well as the purpose of redemption. In the book Education also, pages 18 and 19, it says, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. And then it tells, what is, what is that higher uh, than what human thoughts can reach? Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. So if we come out of school 
like God, we come out godly, then we've had a good education. Before the student, there is open the path of continual progress. Now, unfortunately, human nature is essentially lazy, at least most people are. As I remember it, you know, students just wanted to get through school with as little as they could and just finish and so on. Are we going to uh, tackle salvation that way? If so, we probably won't make it. We won't receive salvation. We won't become godly. There is opened a path of continual progress. He has an object to achieve, a standard to attain that includes, and here's what it has to include, everything good and pure and noble. The rest we don't need. But true education leads us to develop all that's good, pure, and noble. He will advance as fast and as far as possible in every branch of what kind of knowledge? True knowledge. Now, there's a lot of knowledge that's being presented that's not true knowledge. But if we're going to reach the highest attainments, we have to progress only according to true knowledge. But his efforts will be directed to objects as much higher than mere selfish and temporal interests as the heavens are higher than the earth. Unfortunately, most people are studying and thinking and trying to excel in things that really don't matter too much. And God is looking for a generation that will catch the vision of what we've been looking at here and will pursue that which is most important. And if they do, they will reach the goal higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. <clears throat> How are we going to do that? Testimonies to Ministers 119, it says, God can teach you more in one moment by his Holy Spirit than you could learn from the great men of the earth. So let's just pause a moment and try to grasp what this is really saying. Let's suppose that I spend... All of my life, now most of my life is already gone, but let's suppose I started out at 10 years old, 12 years old, whatever, and I let the Holy Spirit teach me. Can you imagine what I would know? But if I let some of the wisest and most talented teachers on earth teach me for my whole life, I still wouldn't know as much as what the Holy Spirit could teach me in one moment. Therefore, if we really want to excel, guess where we have to go? We have to get connected with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can educate us. Because that's how we can excel, and so on. You know, I, I read just a little note one time as I was reading about some of the great educators of the past. I'm not sure they'd be looked upon as the great educators of today. But in the past, they were looked upon as being a great educator. One of them was called Marion Katie. And... Mary and Katie was talking with Ellen White one day, and Mary and Katie was pointing out that God kept taking her in the path where she had no training of how to do it. <coughs> and 
Ellen White admitted that, well, I've been having the same experience. And I resonated with that because most of what I've done in my life was not what I was trained to do. But God called into other fields and other activities that I had no training for. When you're trained, you have a tendency to depend on your training. You have a tendency when you are <coughs> trained. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't get trained. I'm just trying to point out the downside of what tends to happen to us. And so if we get in a situation where there's no hope but the Holy Spirit doing something, that's when we can actually accomplish a, according to what God has in mind for us. In one moment, okay, so we can... Now let's connect this with the latter rain. Zechariah 10.1, promises. And I hope you're claiming this promise. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. We are in the time of the latter rain. And we need to be asking him for the latter rain. Hawaii is getting the latter rain. I noticed they got 20 inches as of yesterday. I don't know what it is today. But 20 inches of rain. This is the kind of rain that is latter rain. <coughs> and Joel 2 Verse 23 says, He will cause to come down for you the rain. But this time, it adds a dimension. The former rain and the latter rain. So in the last days, we have the privilege of receiving both early rain and latter rain. We're going to uh, think about that a little bit. In Testimonies to Ministers, there's just a short section that really gives us some details about this. In the east, the former rain falls at the sowing time. So when the seeds are put in the ground, that's when the early rain comes. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. So as God's word is going into our hearts through true education, and he is connecting us with the Holy Spirit, <coughs> seeds are being put in the ground, and it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to cause those seeds to germinate. Now, there, one of the sad facts of education is that a lot of facts are given people that they never use, either because their life work doesn't call for it to be used or because they just don't bother to use it. They just don't see the value <laughs> in using it. But when it comes to true education, every seed needs to spring into growth. You don't want... Uh, seeds not growing, and that's the early rain. Under the influence of the fertilizing showers, <clears throat> the tender shoot springs up. The latter rain, falling near the close of the season, ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. 
So here we see the imagery that's used. Early rain is a soft rain. We don't want to wash the seeds out of the ground because they don't have any roots yet. So it's a gentle rain. And, and it brings the seeds to pop out of the ground. And then as the plants get strong, then the latter rain falls and pushes the plants to the harvest. And this is why we need both early rain and latter rain. As the dew and the rain are given first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest, so the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. Now, to me, this was a real blessing when I saw the true meaning of this because I think a lot of Adventists are discouraged, and probably other Christians too, discouraged because they're not making the progress that they would like to make. And if they are interested at all in, in becoming fully like Christ, they think, wow, you know, I don't know whether I'll ever make it or not. Well, here is hope. All it takes to reach the full growth of a Christian is to receive the early rain and the latter rain. If you receive both, we can guarantee you, you'll be like Jesus by the time the latter rain is finished with you. However, there is another important aspect. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. That's talking about the latter rain. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. Are we going to doubt that or believe that? Well, without the early and latter rain, we can't believe it, no. But with the early and latter rain, we can believe it. We are able to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. So don't listen to the doubts. Don't spend your time thinking and being discouraged about your doubts. Start thinking about the early rain and the latter rain, and you will receive exactly what you hope for. However, there is this mistake that often is made. The latter rain ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. Now here is, I think, a misunderstanding. <clears throat> In the gardening program, you don't get the heavy rain after the plants are already in full maturity. That's not when you get it. You get it to bring them to maturity. And there are those that try to teach us that, well, you can't even get the latter rain unless you're totally mature. But that doesn't fit. The latter rain develops as well, and that's why it's called grace. It develops fast. Don't worry that you're not far enough along as long as you're receiving the early rain. Don't worry about that. You'll be surprised how much the latter rain can do for you. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Here's where the mistake is made. All, most of my life, I've heard different groups get excited about praying for the latter rain. They never talk about the early rain, only about latter rain. But the problem is, if we don't get the early rain, we can't even get the latter rain. And so we need to start by praying for the early rain. 
And as we receive all that's possible through the early rain, then we will be given the latter rain. And we need to ask for both, but we need to make sure that we recognize the importance of getting the early rain first. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. Every once in a while here at Wildwood, we get a latter rain when the seeds are in the ground. And you know what? It washes them right out. And you don't have anything. You've got to plant over again. I've had that experience a few times. So God wants us to recognize, I have a full plan. The first part of the plan is to plead for the outpouring of the early rain. And as you open your heart to receive the, letter, the early rain, as far as education goes, you will be learning more in a moment than you could learn in your whole lifetime from the great people of earth. And you will be learning about how to be a Christian and what it is that you need to change in your life and the Holy Spirit has power to help you to make the change. And as you get your eyes open to all these things, then he says, okay, they're ready now for the latter rain to be poured out and to become sin-proof to where you don't yield anymore to those things that you are uh, helped by through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Many, in a great measure, failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. Now let me point out as clearly as I can what I believe is supposed to happen under the early rain. God is wanting to search our souls and to reveal to us every sin that we are doing so that we can come to grips with that. If we wait for the latter rain, the latter rain does not do that. It's too late for that. The purpose of the early rain is to reveal every sin and to get the seed started in overcoming that. And of course, the first thing that happens, he creates a desire in our heart to not do that sin anymore, to want to be victorious in that. And then as we walk the Christian life, sometimes we fall, sometimes we succeed, but we keep growing until we fall less and we succeed more. That is all brought about by the early rain. And then when all the areas of our life are growing and there's development taking place, he pours out the latter rain to finish the job. That's why it's so dangerous to be praying only for the latter rain. But we need to be recognizing, like Joel said, in the last days, it's both early and latter rain that we are going to be praying for. And this finishes by saying, when the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. So they're looking in the future and they say, you know, when God pours out the latter rain, I will get all cleaned up and I will get ready for Jesus coming. No. It's too late when that happens. That is the work of the early rain. It says they are making a terrible mistake. And they will end up like the five foolish virgins knocking on the door. And he says, I never knew you. So we don't want to be uh, just praying for latter rain. But it is important that we be praying. Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Now is the time. 
when God is doing these things. And if that's not the top of your prayer list, I hope you will put it there after tonight's meeting, asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in early and latter rain. In the fundamentals, page 187, it gives a warning to us because we're a people that love education, but there are dangers in education. It says the enemy is doing all in his power to obscure heaven's light through what? Educational processes. So <clears throat> the devil knows how important education is to the human race. And so he has special plans to mess people up while they're young. Because that's usually when we do most of our educational uh, study. And he wants to mess us up before we get started. The enemy is doing all in his power to obscure heaven's light through educational processes. Why? For he does not mean that men shall hear the voice of the Lord saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. If we are educated by God or those that are connected with God, they are continually pointing us in the pathway that we should be walking. And when they do that, God is able to educate us, if we will listen and not rebel against it, not be frustrated with the information. We will be educated, and also redemption will be taking place at the same time. So Satan wants to develop an educational program where that doesn't happen. In fact, it actually becomes a hindrance to that endeavor. And again, in Ministry of Healing 439, it says, through perverted educational processes, he is doing his utmost to obscure heaven's light. A lot of people are going to miss heaven because of the education they took and they didn't study what we're studying tonight to realize what they needed to do. And as a result, they end up missing the mark because Satan was very aware of how to do it. But people often are not aware of what he's doing. Fifth Testimonies, page 79. There's a whole chapter here. If sometime you want some shocking reading, you can read this chapter. As I was thinking about the few quotes that I put in this sermon, I was thinking, this chapter was written specifically to Seventh-day Adventist colleges. We didn't have universities then. We had colleges. And this was written specifically to Seventh-day Adventist colleges who were mixed up on what education was all about. <coughs> now, why would that be kept for us to read in the last days? Well, some people use it by saying, you know, uh, that all got cleared up. It's not needed anymore because the problems that existed back then all got cleared up. And one of the problems that are very prominent in here is that you had to read the heathen philosophers for seven years. You had to study their books in order to get a degree. And so, of course, that disappeared, didn't it? And it's gone. So we don't need the chapter. No. I believe the chapter is in there for us because today 
It's far more subtle than seven years of reading heathen philosophers. But it follows the same track. There's so much of the same kind of material in it that God left this on record as a warning in the last days. There are men among us in responsible positions who hold that the opinions of a few conceited philosophers, so-called, are more to be trusted than the truth of the Bible or the testimonies of the Holy Spirit. So here we have two aspects presented. What human beings think who are proud of themselves as to how much knowledge they think they have. And on the other side, we see the information that God can give to us through the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. If you look at that, she's talking about her own writings. They are more to be trusted <clears throat> than the truth of the Bible or the testimonies of the Holy Spirit. God has shown me that these men are Hazael's to prove a scourge to our people. Now, if you study in the Bible about Hazael, you find he was a heathen king. And Elijah was sent to the heathen king. And in a couple months, I'll give you a sermon uh, on Hazael more. But... Uh, <clears throat> Elijah told Hazael, you're going to destroy mothers with babies and little children. You're going to, you know, kill them with the sword and so on. And he said, is thy servant a dog that he would do such a horrible thing? But you know what? He did exactly what the prophet said he would do. And so uh, the point I believe that the prophet is bringing to our attention here is that Schools can do the same thing to children that Hazael did, not physically take their life, but take their spiritual life before they really can get one. And they're not presenting the, the material, the Bible and the testimonies of the Spirit of God. They're not presenting that material uh, in any kind of big way. God has shown me that these men are Hazael's to prove a scourge to our people. It is taught in most of our schools and comes into the lessons of the nurseries. Thousands who profess to be Christians give heed to lying spirits. Wow. Like I say, that's a, a scary chapter. In Great Controversy 606, it says the message of the third angel will be proclaimed as the time comes for it to be given with the greatest power. When would that be? Latter rain, right? That's when the message is given with the greatest power. The Lord will work through humble instruments leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Now that's a very interesting fact, that the qualification to preach the third angel's message with power does not come from the literary institution. Now, I believe it could come from a literary institution. I don't think it's saying it couldn't. But it's a testimony of the condition of these institutions in the last days that God has to use others to finish his work. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit <clears throat> than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal 
declaring the words which God gives them. And the Bible speaks about being taken away from the plow and different uh, practical activities that God calls men into work for him. And this, this is not a new uh, idea. It has happened many times before. Fifth Testimonies, page 80, says, Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. Those who have rendered supreme homage to science, falsely so-called, will not be the leaders then. So God is going to have to pick the ones that have been getting the true education, <clears throat> the ones that are willing to believe that the Holy Spirit can teach them more in a moment than all the great men of earth. And those are the ones he's going to use. Then, or, or excuse me, those who have trusted to intellect, genius, or talent will not then stand at the head of rank and file. And let me just mention one other uh, thing. You know, when we choose leadership today, most of the time, I won't say all the time, but most of the time we pick people because of those things. Intellect, genius, or talent. And we put them in leadership. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't pick people that way. He picks them because they're willing to listen to him. <coughs> they... <coughs> They did not keep pace with the light. Those who have proved themselves unfaithful will not then be entrusted with the flock. In the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. Now, there's a couple of key points there. Uh, <clears throat> those that have loved to be educated by the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, they are the ones that are going to finish the work. They will be entrusted even with the leadership of the flock in the last days. And unfortunately, few great men will be involved. Why? Largely because of the education that the great men have received. And they have listened to so much of the information that was not from God. And they have gotten wrapped up in that aspect rather than where they needed to be and so a few only a few now it doesn't say none praise God it doesn't say none and so God will use the ones that he can use who have either unlearned or <clears throat> have you know I uh, when we first came to Wildwood back in 1970 <clears throat> They put us to live in another uh, family's home. It was uh, Dr. Hansen and his wife, Ula. And I learned that when he went to medical school, that he studied 50% of the time on Bible and spirit of prophecy. He didn't just study his medical studies. He studied 50% Bible and spirit of prophecy. There's not too many people that are doing that today. And there's not very many schools that are giving 50% Bible and spirit of prophecy. And so uh, this is why we, we have the problem, so that few great men will be engaged. In Fifth Testimonies 82, it says, <clears throat> God will work a work in our day that but few anticipate. He will raise up and exalt among us those who are taught rather by the unction of his spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions. So here we see that God is not dependent upon a long education, especially the kind that's not exactly like he wants it to be. He's not dependent on that. These facilities are not to be despised or condemned. They are 
ordained of God, but they can furnish only the exterior qualifications. Now I wondered, how does that sentence fit in with the rest of what we read? I think what it's telling us is that a school doesn't have to be off, off base. It can be doing things right. And when the information that the school is giving is godly information, regardless of what field of learning it's in, it doesn't really matter what the field is. If it's godly information, it agrees with the Bible, spirit of prophecy, it's solid, correct information. There's a lot of things that are very, very helpful. And so we don't want to just condemn or despise those places. God will manifest that he is not dependent on learned, self-important mortals. So he, he's going to put on a demonstration in the last days through the latter rain of just what we read about. <clears throat> but it's always really been God's plan. Notice this in 1 Corinthians 1, 25 to 27. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So Paul is saying, look around the church. This is the early Christian church. He says, look around. Do you see very many really smart people? Do you see... Uh, very many mighty people or noble people. Uh, rich people is another one we could add in there. Do you see many of them? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Many years ago, I read a story in the bedtime stories. There was a trailer truck in England that didn't pay attention to the tunnel as to how high the tunnel was. And so the truck ran right into the tunnel and jammed in the tunnel, and they couldn't get it out. So they brought in a bunch of experts and they were all trying to figure out how we're going to get this truck out. And nobody could come up with the idea. A little boy walked up to the uh, men that were working. And he said, Mister, why don't you let some air out of the tires? And so they let the air out and the truck was able to back out. That was in the old series of bedtime stories. Now, <clears throat> God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now, some of you may be those weak things. You know, I don't think Wildwood attracts uh, a lot of highfalutin people to come to a place like this. Most people like that, they look at Wildwood and they say, those poor people there. They really don't know what they're doing. And so there's not too many of you that are like that. But that means that you have a good chance. If you understand true education, that true education is Bible and spirit of prophecy and anything else that agrees with that, that is true education. And if you will be drinking in that kind of education, reject everything else, even if you read in one of the books that you're studying something that doesn't agree with the Bible and spirit of prophecy, throw it out. It's, it's not going to be solid. It's not going to be worth uh, storing in your mind. If you will do that and you will pray for the early and latter rain, you can be in the group that are going to finish God's work with latter rain power. But don't, don't just wait for latter rain. You need to get the early rain 
but you can be a part of that finishing of God's work. And you might not be much of anybody now, but he will do something really mighty with you in the future. May God help us to receive that.